while you may think you know everything about the issues and the intrigue of matters arising in the society, there are many expositions that would shock, baffle and even enlighten you. The exclusive gives you answers to some of the hidden works of success. It is revealing, informative, incisive, educative, investigative and soul lifting. Join us on this special episode of the exclusive. Welcome to this special interview program in the name of Jesus. Our focus is on the institution of marriage as ordained by God. The word of God says, one may chase 1,000, but two can chase 10,000. Don't forget that the Bible teaches us that a marriage that grows is ordained to bring honor first to God, second to the couple and taught to the human race. We shall be featuring a couple that have consciously followed God's precepts about marriage. And what do they have to show for it? Their humble but enviable family life, richly blessed by God. They themselves have been impacting positively on my kind in line with divine instruction. Your life will no doubt be blessed tremendously by the time you have watched this program through. With me is a former executive director of NIB, NTA, and a veteran journalist, Shola Atere. We will unfill our special couple shortly. Welcome back. Please join me in welcoming our special couple, Mr. and Mrs. Alakida. The first question we go to Mr. Alakida. I want you to let the viewer know how you grew up first. How you grew up. How you grew up? Oh. I had a very, very strict um, upbringing, Christian too. Uh, at my early age, I lived with an aunt of my father, because my father was a doctor, traveling from town to town in the, what you call them, in, uh, the Delta area. So we stayed in Lagos with the aunt of my father, one Mrs. Randall, a strict Christian woman. And uh, I could remember she was so strict that we dared not go out to buy anything or cook anything on Sundays. All the cooking were done on Saturday evening and on Sunday we were the warm the food to eat. We were regular at church services. 
and then she was a very, very stupid woman that brought up quite a lot of uh, young men and women. Uh, she was like a, a mother in me, where everybody in the community looked up to. Uh, we live mainly among some Muslims there. But I allowed us to integrate with them. In fact, most of the uh, Muslim parents uh, brought their children to be tutored by Allah Mrs. Raya. The same person who goes to Mrs. Then I come from a Muslim background, a family of 52 children, eight wives, and um, child number eight. I give glory to God that uh, from the age of seven, myself and one of my half sisters were sent to England to study. Um, we came back after four years of studies. So well, we were going to school this year, and we grew up with our other siblings. Um, it was a case where all the children interacted well with one another, but the wives, of course, as usual, would be at each other's team uh, for a good part of the time. But, you know, things worked out. Um, we were in boarding school came out of school and uh, later on I went back to England to study uh, fashion design much later in life. Uh, okay, maybe I should uh, go to the point where we actually got married, had children. Okay. Well, uh, obviously, you know, your marriage is a blessing in religious harmony too. Besides uh, being a lesson, uh, young ones for evidence you know, in terms of stability and everything. Uh, Madam, let me just ask you, you know, what exactly you know, memorable that you can remember, you know, of your childhood and uh, your perception of your years, you know, from that uh, uh, era. My parents. Uh, were traders. Um, they were very much in the in the center of trading in Lagos. Uh, my father was a, a merchant of uh, textiles and shoes and stockfish. That was what he did throughout his lifetime. And, uh, he made a lot of money. Um, my mother was also the textile trader, she purchased a lot from him and uh, had her own store and uh, purchased from others at the same time. I learned a lot from my mom growing up because when we were on holidays, I would spend um, all my holidays in her store. And I knew that during that time, I learned a lot in terms of uh, business through, uh, you know, the act of going to a store and interacting with the customers and all of that. I learned a lot about textiles, um, merchandising, colors, textures, um, how to relate to clients. Um, and how to do business generally. I was in boarding school, at the various boarding schools, and discipline was key um, in those uh, boarding schools. You weren't allowed to you know, leave school without permission, of course. Um, my mother was a very strict woman. She brought up all her children uh, very well. She was a no-nonsense woman. She taught all of us how to cook and um, we used to share the home chores 
uh, we were two girls, um, five boys, and in those days, I used to think that she was very wicked. But in hindsight, I have come to, she's dead now, both my parents are dead, I've come to appreciate her all the more with each passing day and thanked her in my heart and even in my prayers uh, for what I learned growing up with her. Um, there's nothing I can't do now. Uh, I'm not saying that she's the one that taught me how to change tires, but I, I change the tires of cars if and when need be. Um, because she had taught us to be, um, uh, to be able to face any challenge at any time, to be able to uh, do anything when we need to, to be able to take right decisions at the right time, and not to be afraid to, to speak up, not to be afraid to uh, do whatever you needed to do. And all of that has made me who I am today, and I give glory to God. Well, sir, let me take you back, you know, to your uh, childhood days, early childhood, you know. Uh, you said that uh, you were being made to cook. I mean, cooking was done on Saturday, so that on Sunday they just want the food. Would it be that uh, they wanted to ensure that you are punctual at the church services? Did you regard your parents too as wicked reports, you know? <laughs> I was the youngest and then um, I was the baby in the house. Uh, my mother's, uh, my, my, my father's aunt was quite advanced in age. But we had discipline. Um, well, she wasn't, she wasn't a very strict woman. She was kind, generous, and quite understanding. Although once in a while we did get decay, but it was out of love, not out of any hatred or out of any frustration. Like any other boy growing up, well, we played our pranks, but she was quite accommodating. But she was a very, very strict Christian. Made us go to church, made us read the Bible. And then, um, as for not cooking on Sunday, it's part of the old Christian tradition. Seven day, uh, six days, the seventh is the Sabbath. And you should take a rest where you should not. Uh, on that day, any rigorous work is a day, or it's supposed to be a day of rest and a day of worship. But that point, in fact, those days, most towns don't even open. And uh, it's only now that, well, uh, they don't observe the seventh day anymore. Every day is like any other day. And that was why I was brought up. And in addition to that, I attended a mission school, uh, the CMS Grammar School. Uh, Venerable Adela was the headmaster. I played a lot of pranks, but he never spared the Lord. Uh, as well as uh, Mr. Lobo, who was the vice principal. We were given straight Christian training, both in academics and in social life. It was uh, a good education we had, a good Christian education we, that was imparted in us. I didn't break the venerable idea like that I did not put any nonsense from anybody. Anywhere you may come from, and wherever your father or your parents will be, 
Lord, to take the life. Yes, this question is for the judge you for Mr. Amanda earlier. Many young people normally when they are growing up used to dream of so many things they want to become official. But when they are getting to that old they seem not to fulfill that dream. I don't know whether you have that recognition of growing up when you are growing and what was your dream when you were growing up. And when I was growing up, my dream initially was to be a church man. Maybe from the exposure we had to the church. Later on in life, I thought, well, maybe because uh, I'm very well, uh, I'm outspoken, especially in terms of politics. And I wanted to read politics and um, economics. Those who are later on in life. But just at the last minute before I did admission to university, a friend of my father, uh, later at the Wally Thompson, came around. I was helping to solve and uh, his friends. And well, and they made a conversation. Young man, what do you want to do? I said, well, I'm waiting for my own ability to go to the university to read political science and economics. And I said, oh, no, why don't you read to a professional course? And I said, like what? I said, your grandfather was a lawyer, a successful lawyer. Why did you read law? And that was how I changed. And then I was admitted to the University of Lagos to read law where I did the LLB and then from there to the law school. And I was called to the bar in 1971. My dream was to be a lawyer. Uh, I guess maybe if I had been a lawyer, maybe that's where we would have met as well. I don't know. I guess we were, we were, we were, we were about to meet, but my, my father wouldn't let me be a lawyer. Uh, he, he, he made a joke of it, actually. And he said, ah, lawyers well, don't get jobs anymore. They go knocking on doors, soliciting for, for, for briefs. So we laughed about it. Um, well, he laughed about it. <laughs> I didn't find it funny because that's what was in my heart. Yeah. And uh, he said, no, no, no. Um, I'd rather you go and study the secretarial course because somewhere down the line you're going to get married and you're going to change your name. Yeah. And uh, whoever marries you, you're going to bear the name of that person. Yeah. And he felt that uh, you could tell that he wasn't the type of man who really wanted to um, expend too much or invest a lot in uh, the female gender. Because he thought that um, it's the male genders that would carry on with his name. Anyway, obey, I had to. I didn't have a choice. So I went back to England and I studied uh, the secretary office. I go to Mr. Alex Davis. Talk about Muslim background to Christians. At what point do you get into that? At what point? Um, throughout my secondary school days, I was going to church. And when I got married, uh, I wasn't going to church. We weren't doing anything, we weren't going anywhere. I would go to the market on Sundays, and my husband would go to the garden on Sundays. 
um, when I his his mom started trying to encourage us to be taking the children to church, and uh, my husband said, "Well, the children leave, 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 leave the children when they grow up, because the fact that his wife is from a Muslim background and he's from a Christian background, that maybe when the children grow up, they'll choose which of the religions that they'd rather follow." But um, there came a time later on when um, I started getting um, hungry to know God and I spoke to my husband. He had been uh, confirmed when he was much younger, um, but our children, yes, they were going to church in school, but when they were home, they were watching TV. So, you know, I started developing this hunger to know God. And I spoke to him about it and he agreed that, okay, we should start going to church and the children should, uh, you know, uh, be, be, be confirmed. Um, that, that ties that confirmed. And that's when we started going to church as a family. Well, Sam and Mark, you know, uh, obviously you had quite an interesting childhood. Uh, growing up, how many of your peers at that time, if you refer back now, are you still in touch with and you often relive the past in, uh, in any special way? In my own case, I went from Christchurch Cathedral School and um, quite a large number of us from their attended service drama school. Uh, from 1953 till now, we still keep, uh, well now, we have an association. Uh, 1959, uh, 63 set of service drama school. There are very few of us left, but we make it a duty of meeting once a month. And uh, those that can still walk and those that are still strong do make it a point of duty to attend. Usually, well, there are very few of us, but the average now is about 20 people. 20 of us, and we'll be best friends to each other. We've been friends since elementary school, and we're still friends. We keep that relationship going. Well, I went to several schools okay. <laughs> in, in, in different parts of Well, um, very few of us know where others are. We don't have a, a social um, arrangements of that kind. Um, now and again we bump into one another. People seem to be scattered in different parts of the world actually. Um, that's the way it's been. Uh, maybe because uh, most, most, most of you must have changed names. You know? Also that, <laughs> yes. Also that. Did you have any regret from your youth age? How would you like to relieve those regrets? And how you were able to surmount those challenges when you were growing up? Um, I live a normal life. Grew up like any other young man my age. I never had any problem that was insurmountable. Went to school, I was an average student throughout. And I don't think there is any time I had any regrets in things I did or did not do. 
if I had to, I will do it just the same way as I did it and as I'm doing it. I would have said that um, my only regret is that I didn't go to university. But then later on in life, in marriage, I decided to uh, do an online graduate uh, degree course. And I s went through the first year. Uh, the first term, I had Bs and B minuses. And after that, I started having As. And then my father died. A month later, my mother died. And I was in business, running a home. Uh, and uh, I had various businesses, you know, my hands. And it became cumbersome to continue. And with the results I had within that first one year, I had said to myself that I was completely satisfied. Now that I've tasted it, known what it's like, and known how I would have fared if I had gone to university, then I had peace. I had peace within myself. And maybe even if I had gone to university, and maybe even if I had done the law degree that I had wanted to do, maybe I wouldn't have turned out the way I've turned out now. So, no, no further regrets to so, the glory of God. So, Madam, in essence, what you're saying is that the youth should know that once you are determined, and as you said earlier, you seek the face of uh, God, you can achieve, you can move a mountain. You can. You can move a mountain. Because you would have made up your mind that, okay, because through prayer you have been directed and you are following your, your destiny and you are a determined person within yourself and you are focused, there's nothing you can't achieve. Because that's how God has created us to be. Viewers, we'll be right back after this short break. Stay tuned. The Anglican Cable Network Nigeria, ACNN, is your most reliable gospel TV station that brings to you quality TV programming which builds your spiritual life and enhance your walk with God through the undiluted Word of God. Join us on our social media platforms anytime you miss your favorite program. Subscribe to our YouTube channel with the address www.youtube.com forward slash ACNN TV and click that video that matters to you. Protect your vote is a euphemistic way of saying do everything to make sure you can share blood, you can kill to ensure that the person you voted for is the one that emerged as a winner at the end of the day. There is never a dull moment on our Facebook page as we are dedicated to keep you informed with the up-to-date news about the church and other information. Just log on to www.facebook.com forward slash TV for you can now watch some of our programs live on your mobile device. Follow us on Twitter with the handle at acnntv.com and you'll be glad you did. So now, there is no longer regret each time you miss any episode of your favorite programs as you can now watch them on the go, anytime, anywhere. ACNN, we are indeed reaching the world with the undiluted word of God. Yes, welcome back to this program with our lovely couple, Mr. and Mrs. Alakia. Have you let the viewers know your strategy? How this marriage started? Well, we were at a party somewhere in Sulu. I was single, she was single. She came to the brother to visit her party. And then um, we got talking. And uh, the brother had been quite approved. Because he thought I was a typical famous boy. 
Não é só a dentro do parque de Arte Sanetista, se botar a Rai dos Bem, a Giacrit, very much to me, the Sampuva of the God, and then I took her home, and then we exchanged telephone numbers and address, and then we started a communication from there. Well, the reader has decided how you met. Exactly like that. Except that uh, you took me to my home, not his home. I said, no. Looking into the introduction, you are bonding together like a fable story of no matter what you get over four decades now. What is the secret behind this? Um, tolerance. Oh. Tolerance and tolerance. Uh, we do have our differences. But we learn to see less of each other's faults. and to accept other as we find each other. I believe in its tolerance and affection, desire to be successful in life. We are a common goal and it is the common goal and tell us that's to be lost together. I'll add to that. Communication has uh, been extremely helpful. Um, you have to talk to one another. Keep communication going at all times, regardless of whatever the situation is. Um, you have to discuss everything, really to make any marriage work. You can't keep some things in the background and expect that your marriage will work by magic or by wishful thinking. No. Um, for any marriage to work, you have to keep on at it, improving on it. Deciding within yourself that together, this is the way we want to go and be focused along that path. You have to be patient with one another. Uh, in Nigeria and in Yoruba land, we say that uh, the mouth, the tongue, they, they quarrel, they fight. But, you know, you have to settle because you need one another uh, to make everything work. Marriage is about matriculation and no convocation. That's the will of God. So there will always be ups and downs. But the Bible also tells us that you must never allow the sun to go down before you settle any rifts between you. Otherwise, you'll find that with every action, there's a reaction. With every reaction, there's a counter reaction and so on and so forth. And the devil always would want to wade in and make matters worse. And that's why we have been taught from scripture that this is the way to go. And, you know, agreeing to agree is always very important. Setting values within your home setting is important. And you have children, they have to be ground rules. Even in bringing your children up and in liaising with one another as well, you have to have ground rules. You find that if you do all of these things, and there are so many more, I mean, the list is endless. You know, go we'll carry on talking about those things. But those are some of the key things 
that would make a marriage work and last. Um, appreciating one another at all times. Um, realizing that the other party needs you and you need the other party. You need one another to make everything work. And that's why when God created Adam, he said it's not good for a man to be alone. He said, I'll make him a helper, comparable to him. If Adam could stand alone, God would not have created Eve. So he gave each their own roles. And it is in playing our roles that we can actually make our marriages work. When well, we give glory to God. Well, sir, uh, you heard Madame Amelia to a too, that uh, marriage is full of ups and downs. There's no doubt about that. Uh, with due respect, you know, the name of your wife is, you know, uh, very popular. Let me put, put it mildly like that, you know. Uh, Paul's magazine has published her name as a very rich woman and so on and so forth. You know. Are you not intimidated by that? No, no way. So, how have you been getting along? Nothing wrong anywhere, so there's nothing to patch. <laughs> it's just a normal life. You you can only wash your hands with the two hands, not one. So it is it isn't an issue as far as I'm concerned. We do things together in the same way we have. That's it. We have a common purpose and we work together. Well, Madam, do you still cook for him at any time? I make sure that I do that from time to time. We have cooks, but I love cooking. Um, at weekends, I know what he likes, sure. so you know. Sometimes I I cook them. I enjoy it, and uh, he looks forward to it too. And to add to what he said, yes. we even have a common purpose. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I do relate to yourself as a husband and wife. You said one, and I do not enjoy this kind of uh, uh, fork shed you have. We relate with one another with uh, mutual respect. And you came in here today. You find that uh, we're working together. Yes. And if it hadn't worked, you wouldn't have found us like this. Uh, we've been working together for many years now. Uh, me knowing that he's the boss, he's the chairman, I'm the vice chairman, and I have my place as the vice chairman, just as he has his place as the chairman. Uh, and at home, he's uh, God's representative in our home. I realize that. And I give him the honor and the respect and I acknowledge that. And he does. How do you relax? How do we relax? Um, well, he likes relaxing watching CNN. <laughs> That's what we that's the channel we watch the most. Um, sometimes we watch uh, other local channels, listen to the news and what have you. Um, how do I relax? Uh, I used to go and play lawn tennis, but I don't have time for that as much uh, anymore. Um, I collect a lot of books. I hardly have time to read them. Um, the day is loaded with so much work. Uh, well, I. Boy, you don't miss reading the Bible. I, no, I don't miss it. I read every day, <laughs> so there's not a matter of uh, 
miss reading it because you know I read my Bible every day. Um, it's one of the things that you can't push aside. You just have to do it, whether you like it or not. Um, I think I relax working and uh, doing more work. <laughs> I enjoy working. <laughs> Oh uh, well, I swim for half an hour, five to six days a week, and then I love gardening. Uh, whenever I, when I wake up, I go to my garden, look round. Do some gardening for about half an hour before I do anything else. Then I go swimming and then come come here. Uh, gardening is quite relaxing. And you look at uh, what you've uh, uh, seeds you planted. You see them grow. They're quite relaxing and quite satisfying. And that's how I start my day. Then come to work in the evening. We have our meals together. And then on Sundays, our children, we make it mandatory that our children and grandchildren, after service, come to have lunch with us. So we bring in the younger ones. And uh, we exchange ideas and um, give them advice where necessary. Traveling will be one of the things that will take most of the time. Having COVID to travel in and outside the country. Well, we hardly travel within the country. <laughs> We're Lagos lizards. <laughs> as uh, people say. Uh, yes, um, various things they take us out of the country. Uh, we spend time together as, as a family and uh, sometimes uh, one or two businesses take us out of the country. Uh, we don't stay away for long spells, maybe a week or two. And uh, we're back in Nigeria. But even when we are abroad, we find that, you know, we still have to dot eyes and cross T's with work coming from home. Uh, thank God for uh, telecommunication that has made things much easier these days. So, um, that's how we go. Well, Madam, I want to ask you this question directly. Uh, you had over four decades of marriage. Even if it's just one day extra, it's over four decades. Definitely. Obviously, you know, the marriage has been relatively peaceful for the third of the strength. Yes. Uh, there's no third party influence or something that would disrupt uh, such a union. Mm -hmm. So, what advice? Will you give now your grandparents? Definitely. Uh -huh, and your children are getting married. Yes. What advice are you going to give to uh, in you know, with regards to the marriage? I would advise that um, in laws should not turn themselves into outlaws. <laughs> uh, as much as possible, um, the couple themselves should not encourage their in-laws to interfere in their affairs. Um, give them their due place and position of respect. Um, attend to them if and when needed. Um, but my advice is that one should not encourage in-laws to live with uh, you know, young couples or any couples of any age, really. Um, because you find that within laws, they always have an ulterior motive. They always have uh, a hidden agenda. 
um, they have um, issues, they, they have their own opinions about any issue. Ideally, they should let the couples work things out themselves and live with one another the, the way they, 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 they like to and uh, let them run their own homes rather than interfere. I thank God that we have never uh, invited any friends or, or in-laws to wade into anything that's going on between us. We don't give them that opportunity. We sort things out between ourselves and within our own nuclear family. And we leave it at that. So, um, even if in-laws want to interfere, we don't encourage them. We don't give them that opportunity. And we, we, we let them know their place. And that is how it has been and how it has worked for us. To the glory of God. Well, sir, let me come back to you. You know, the young, younger ones now, they, they have uh, some strange perception about marriage, you know, to the extent that uh, some feel, both male and female, you know, that possibly it's like living in bondage. You know, these days of uh, freedom, you know, and everybody wants to exercise, wants to be doing what he's been doing before, the lady wants to be as free as air, you know, that kind of thing. With your experience in marriage, what advice would you give them? Is it a sweet thing to go? To me, marriage is not uh, a bondage. It is a union between two willing people who have common goals in life. And uh, are prepared to pursue those common goals jointly by not being selfish to each other, by being open with each other, and uh, as I said earlier. Tolerance is part of it as well, too. You don't have to be selfish. Once you have a common goal and live a common purpose, I think, well, you can work things out from there. I think that it's not only the church that should prepare children for marriage. Parents, too, must prepare them, sit them down, and even as they're growing up, we're really supposed to be teaching them how to live with one another, even from what they see us do. They're supposed to be able to take from that. You'll find that there are some children who come from homes where the husband and wife are always at each other's throats. And when they're arguing, they're doing it in the presence of the children. And the children grow up with that kind of notion. They, they, when, they, when they grow up and they get married, and maybe even some are beating, the, some, some husbands are beating their wives. And they, they go away with that notion that, you know, when they get married, you know, it, 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 it's normal to beat their wives. You understand? So you find that. They're, a lot of them are re reflecting um, what they have grown up with. But also these days, we find that there's a lot of influence from the Western world, from what they watch in movies. You understand me? Uh, forgetting the kind of culture and background that they've come from, the African setting, where wives are obedient and submissive to their husbands. These days, it's a matter of, eh, you went to university, I went to university, what makes you think that 
you know, you should be Lord and Master over me. What makes you think that uh, you should tell me what to do or give me orders? You get what I'm saying? Uh, so they want to fight that, forgetting that it is in unison that they can really prosper and enjoy each other's company. Yes, times are changing. The economy all over the world is not as good as it used to be, where things used to run smoothly. Nowadays, you find that both the man and woman need to work to be able to you know, make ends meet. As a result, some things are suffering within the home. You understand me? In, 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 you know, in bringing up the children. Um, and you find that because of that, the, 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 the man is, you know, bringing money into, you know, getting the family going. And the woman is also bringing money into getting the family going. The, 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 the females these days, it, it, it tends to get into their heads that, well, uh, we're both, you know, putting money on the table to get the family going. So what right do you have to tell me what to do? Uh, it's wrong. You also find that the, the church has a role to play. And how many are really going to church anymore to even listen to what is being said in church? And to do the right thing the way God wants us to do it. Marriage is about living our lives according to the will of God. It's all over the Bible how God wants us to live as husband and wife and as children growing up to become parents themselves. Do you understand? So all of that is decaying and little or no attention is being paid to that as a result of which children are losing it. Those moral values that used to be there are not being inculcated into them as much as it used to be in the olden days. And, you know, things are just going haywire. Their minds are being, you know, um, distorted from the way it should be and collectively and individually we all have a role to play to bring them back to the way God desires for marriage to be. <clears throat> if I may take you back a little bit while I'm speaking, we talk about managing the same force very difficult nowadays for so many couples. Money has been the major crisis in homes. It's breaking many homes now. You cannot find a woman having the same force with his husband or other. Some women believe let the husband carry the major brunt of the whole uh, financial you know, bodies in home. How can you let us know? the way you've gone about this and let people know how that can be workable in the hope to bring peace. Well I think it's I think it starts from submission. Oh. God desires that every woman should be submissive in everything to her husband, including her earnings. That works for us. I choose to be submissive to my husband in every area because I want my marriage to work. I'm reading my Bible and I want to practice what I read. So if you want your marriage to work, as Christians most especially, you need as a woman to be submissive to your husband. And your husband too has his own role to play 
Yes, to look after his family. But sometimes it doesn't always work like that. Sometimes a man could be out of a job. But does that mean that that is when the woman should lord, lord it over her husband? Just because she has a job, her husband doesn't have a job, is that when to become rude? No, absolutely not. That is when he needs you the most. He needs you in prayer to be praying for him. He needs you to support him. That is why God made you help her. And you have to be the helper in every area. Wherever there's anything lacking and you can provide that, step in. I read a book once written by a, a female teacher. She was earning more than her husband. And her husband was a very quiet man. She was behaving as if she was the husband. She found herself to be, okay, breadwinner and she began to be rude to her husband it got to a stage where their daughter fell ill and god this is a true life story i know the woman i read the book and i called her and i said to her i said did god really tell you that he would actually kill your daughter if you continued misbehaving towards your husband, she said yes. She was in hospital with her daughter for months. And God told her that if she did not change her attitude towards her husband, that he would take her daughter away. She changed. She became a woman who would bring home her pay packet and give it to her husband. Her daughter became well. She changed her attitude today. She wrote that book. The book is called uh, I Fear God. And those were some of the things that happened to her that made her fear God. And now she goes all over preaching to people. I, would, I, I, I think I'm going to invite her to one, or one of our events in our ministry to come and talk to some of the young ones about this matter that we are talking about to drum some sense into them to remind them that they, the women have to be submissive to their husbands he is God's representative in the home so when you know each knows their roles and their place and they're playing their roles the way they should uh, I believe that we'll have Less number of breakages in marriages. So, in relation to that, then come on first. Well, we're open with each other. We believe we have to do everything together, as the Yoruba say. Our Meji. She doesn't hide anything from me. I don't hide anything from her. Uh, there were days when we were much younger that I would go to the market and buy food or maybe on the way stop to buy some fish she does the same and uh, we bring everything together uh, for, the, for the family. So it's not been selfish with each other. I don't have a separate account anywhere or giving money to my cousin 
or my sister to keep for me, or which one. And she doesn't do the same too, so. Well, it's like uh, in the act of apostles, like right, I say, and they have everything in common. Mm -hmm. We have a saves, we have a keep money. She goes there, take whatever she wants. I go there, take whatever I want to. And nobody asks each other any question what have you done with the money. And moreover, well, I will do not indulge in too much expenses. Well, she buys so most of my shoes for me. And whenever I travel, I buy a few things for her too. So I think it's just a bother out of trust. We have noticed that your contributions in never get the same, as well as in philanthropy and legendary. What is your driving force about this? Maybe you answer for God has been enormously kind to us. We enjoy good health. We're comfortable with money. God has been kind. It's just the art of giving back to the society out of the abundance of grace God has given. We're not doing it for any reward whatsoever. Some say some do it for politics. Mm. We don't do it for politics. We're not interested in politics. Uh, we, we, it's our own way of saying thank you, Lord, for all you have done for us. There are so many that are less privileged than us. We find ourselves in this position, and we know that it has not been by our power, by our might, but has been through His special grace, His love, and nothing that we can attribute to our ability. One can work all one's life and not be able to put anything together. But that hasn't been our story. It hasn't been our testament. It has been the exact opposite. So what can we do but reach out and touch? And then also what we do through um, the foundation has been a calling. The Bible says many are called but few are chosen. He has called us and he has also chosen us to reach out and touch those people as well, widows and orphans in our society. And we do our best for them. And we just continue to pray that we'll be able to do a lot more uh, wherever we find ourselves. Well, madam, are you still involved in fashion design? Or is any of your children not involved in it? Well, None of our children are involved in it. Okay. Uh, I stopped fashion design 16 years ago. Okay. But I'm still the life trustee of the of FADAN, the Fashion Designers Association of Nigeria. So I give them support from time to time. Uh, fashion is in my blood. I've always loved fashion. Um, so whether I'm making the clothes or they're being made for me, I love to wear them. Then what would be my advice to this one while it's coming up? Alright? In terms of... In terms of ambition in life, what they will be looking up to. Because if many of them have so many dreams, some people today are going to be in a jobless uh, situation, they don't know what they should do as a profession. But mm -hmm. some events, what you would be your advice to the younger ones coming up? You know, because if you come and tell you how to come, they have to come next. Well, it won't be just the younger ones that I'll talk to. I'd also like to talk to the, the parents as well. I don't think parents should really be choosing professions for their children. Um, each and every human being has a purpose in life. Um, uh, God has created each and every one of us for something. Um, children should be encouraged to look inwards. 
themselves and uh, try and find out why they're in this world. It's especially if you're a Christian. I mean, children are supposed to have been brought up the Christian way like from you know a young age. So they should learn to you know begin to talk to God about guidance. And their parents as well should teach them how to take major decisions through prayer. So it's it's God that's the ultimate guide, really, that would tell you where He wants you to be. Because that's where you will excel the most. And then, you know, the Holy Spirit lives in, within us. And He speaks to us and directs us and guides us. But, you know, we also need to communicate with the Holy Spirit, you know, for, for direction. So, um, my advice to the young ones is to take these matters to the Lord in prayer before we take major decisions in our lives especially about that of career. Uh, so it's, it, it, that's, that's the ideal way to go, to the best of my, you know, my, my knowledge. Um, looking back, I didn't have that opportunity. I wasn't brought up the Christian way, yes. I was brought up in a Muslim uh, setting, but you know, it wasn't a strict Muslim setting. Um, my father wasn't a fanatic, my mother wasn't a fanatic, yes. Later on in life they became, uh, they, they went to Hajj, and they became Elijah and Elaji and all of that. Um, but, you know, going to school, we were allowed to choose our own um, religion. Uh, I tried the, the Muslim religion for, for a term in school. I didn't like it. And, you know, we were also going to church on Sundays in school, despite the fact that I was in a Muslim school. Um, and I liked it. Uh, growing up as a teenager, I, I knew all the, um, the, you know, the, the hymns in church. So, um, I think that uh, children should be allowed to look inwards, pray about it, choose their own professions, and not be forced by their parents to choose a particular uh, profession. Well, uh, I have an example in my family where the father thought he could impose his wish and his profession on his children. And in this particular case, the gentleman was a very, very brilliant young man. He could have been an engineer, he could have been a doctor, he could be a lawyer. He had the attitude and the ability, but his father forced him to take up his profession, I was a failure in that profession. So, my advice is that parents should let children discover themselves, have their own thinking, have their own callings, and only be of guidance to them in the choice of their profession, but not forcing a profession or a job on the children. We are given not have the trust, we are given not have the ability. We are riding on but we have to round up with one of these contentious issues of the Christian world. It's about uh, same sex marriage. It is polarizing the church. And uh, I'd like to have your view about this and how this thing can be sorted out. You know, it's one of the problems that is faced with the headship of the church. Not in Nigeria, but in which, in whichever way you may look at it, it is an accommodation. I did not go to school to 
learn to distort facts. But learn to uphold facts. God did not create man and man and women to women to marry. Maybe if they so if they born to be gays, I will call it a little bit of imperfection of nature. But if it's a habit, then it's a very, very dirty and bad habit. As uh, Mugabe said. Lock two men up in the same room. If they cannot produce a baby, then they should not adopt a baby. Whichever one looks at it, I do not subscribe to it. Well, I believe every word in the Bible. And he tells me that God created Adam and he put him in the garden to tend the garden. And then he realized that he needed the partner and he brought them together and he gave him Eve and he commanded them. He said, be fruitful, multiply. He said, you have dominion over the fish in the seas, over the birds in the air, and over every living thing. Be fruitful and multiply. Ever since God created the earth, the only way that man and woman have been able to be fruitful, to subdue the earth, and to multiply has been through the unism. And I've always said that marriage is a union of two people of the opposite sex who have agreed to love one another to live together forever with God as their witness. I don't think God is in two males to multiply. I didn't read my Bible. He's in two females to multiply. How will they get children? It has never happened. They have adopted and those adoptions have been through only one source, the unison of a man and a woman. Otherwise, have those children dropped from heaven above? No. So I think that says it all. End of story as far as I'm concerned. Thank you for your time with me now. Apart from physical. And the prayers of the Lord are reached. They are all what you have said and what they have heard. May the Lord continue to be with you and your marriage. Thank you for your question. Yes, I am sure you have gained a lot from our guest. May you be blessed by what you have watched and gained to continue to enrich your lives. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. On behalf of the Primate of the Church of Nigeria, we can come in. Our viewers and those of us from the Aglican Cable Network, Nigeria, for finding time out of their busy schedule to share their worthy experiences with us. May the Lord continue to guide, guard, and bless you and your family in Jesus' name. It is at this point that we would like to say bye for now until we bring you another episode that will enrich your lives.